Are you in uh, Denton right now? Yes, I'm here. And it's gloomy, but it's it's not cold, so I'll take it. And you're teaching at North Texas, right? Yeah. yeah. Remind me, how long have you had that gig? Seven years now. Did you go directly from New York to uh, Texas? Because I remember running into you at the Needle and so forth. Like, what was the what was the journey that took you from here to there? So I'm from Michigan. I don't know if you knew that. I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I moved to New York in 2000. Uh, I was in New York from 2000 to 2010. And then, uh, and then I moved to Canada, of all places, to Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba, which was good to me, but I'm happy not to be there anymore. Great people there. Um, I was there for seven years where I taught uh, at a, the University of Ma Manitoba. And then I moved here in 2017, uh, where I've been for seven years. How early on did you know that that was your dream to like teach college students? You know, I, it wasn't really a dream. Um, it's still not a dream necessarily, but it was something that like teaching is kind of in my family. Both my parents are great educators. And without me knowing it, I just kind of got into it. I, I had my first experience teaching music. Uh, I, I went to school for jazz, like jazz performance, but I got an opportunity to, to take over a full-time position uh, teaching what was a middle school band orchestra like all like a full time position, and uh, I was basically taken over for a teacher who had a nervous breakdown because it was at an inner school inner city school and he just he couldn't talk to him. he didn't know how to handle him. and so I got there having no teaching like literally no teaching experience and I got up there and it was literally like literally like coolie high higher learning you know kids throwing paper airplanes and passing gas and curse. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? With? And uh, and it ended up being an amazing semester. I connected with them. They felt connected to me. And I tapped into all the, you know, the uh, words of wisdom that my parents and my teachers all told me. And I, that's when I realized I had a, a, teach, a knack for teaching and connecting to students. But my plans were already set to, to go to New York. So uh, I moved to New York the following year, but that was in my back pocket. And then that experience really helped me later on when Jimmy Green, you know, Jimmy Green, uh, saxophonist. I know of him. I don't know him personally. We were playing and he's like, hey, man, uh, I don't know if this interests you, but there's a teaching position at a university that's open in Manitoba. Um, and at the time, Steve Kirby was running it, bass player who I, I also knew from New York and a bunch of cats from New York. Uh, George Colligan was there. I was like, well, I guess I should apply. It was 2010. I wasn't that busy. You know, I was moderately busy, but it was okay. It was okay. So uh, it just kind of came at the right time for me to explore, even though it was hard to, to move from New York. You know, when you're in New York, like, man, I got everything. I don't need to move. Why would I ever consider moving? And you forget that there is life outside of New York. So I applied and I got it. And it was a very hard decision to leave New York. But I said, well, if I don't like it, I can always move back to New York. New York's, you know, I, I, whatever. It'll be like pick, riding a bicycle like I'd never left. So I'd, I actually didn't tell anybody when I left. Unlike now, when people get a, a teaching, and, hey, I got a teaching, I'm full time. Just... But back then, I was one of the first of like the younger cats uh, of my peers to take a, a full full time, not like part time adjunct, full time position in a completely different location than New York. Um, and it turned out to be a great decision looking back. But every day I was there, especially in Winnipeg, it was cold, man. It was so cold um, that amongst other things, I was like, man, why did I move here? What is wrong with me? And so after that, within that first year, I was really considering moving back. Um, but then I gave it time and and there are so many benefits of being there. Time, space, resources, stability. There was just a lot of positives that made me kind of just wait it out and, and be patient. And I'm glad I did. Yeah, sometimes patience is the key. Well, I kind of want to go chronologically here because I'm, I'm very interested in the in the New York chapter when I used to see you play. What do you think of the gigs you were playing 
Is there any that stands out as having the biggest influence on your playing or affecting your development or direction as a player the most? Woo! Damn, that's a tough one, man. Don't want to put you in hot water. Just because he doesn't name something doesn't mean it wasn't important to you guys. Right, right, exactly. Uh, let me think. Well, I, I will definitely say playing with... So I moved there in 2000. And uh, one of the first things, which, you know, we, I guess we, you know, I don't specifically remember when we met. Um, I don't know if you have recollection of that. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if we actually spoke or not, but I know I used to see you playing at the Needle. I think you played with my friend Daisuke, um, and I would, I would see you in various uh, spots performing. Yeah, exactly. So the Needle, the, the Cleopatra's Needle was a spot that uh, my friend Randy Napoleon and Julius Tolentino, they had a gig. And um, my friend Randy, he, he talked me up before I moved to New York. He's like, man, my, my man, he's really swing a drummer from Michigan, man. You should get him on. So w- right when I moved, I lived uh, 104 on Broadway. And uh, Randy had talked me up so much that when I got there, everybody kind of knew me. And it was just a matter of me sitting in and, and people hearing me. And I swear, within a week, I, I had a steady kind of uh, house gig at Cleopatra's, which is a great place to meet so many people um, with Ju- Julius Tolentino. So that was probably the first and most important gig that I got early on that introduced me to so many people um, and helped me just grow as a musician, helped me ingratiate me to the, the New York scene and the, the New York energy in the music. Um, and then I would say, um, I, I would say maybe within a year I started playing with, um, see, I, I'm, I'm bad with chronologic, but I think I started playing with Tom Harrell and Benny Green around similar time, um, which if you know either of them, totally different, you know, very different ends of of music of music making and approaches to music um both equally incredible so i played with benny green for about a year in his trio ironically after my roommate (laughs) who was playing guitar with him um and that was incredible in just learning how to really he would say lay in the cut and swing like play good time not necessarily feel like you have to play a lot of stuff to, to to create the energy and the intensity of the groove. Um, and really being very meticulous on how we played hits. You know, um, he was very meticulous about how I played my hi-hat and longs and shorts. And I was like, wow, I mean, we'd spend, you know, an hour, two hours just on an introduction, an eight measure introduction, you know, it's very specific. Um, and then on the other end, Tom Harrow, I was with for three years and recorded a couple albums with is not specific at all. In fact, he would give me very little. Actually, he would give me no instructions. He would just bring in these incredible charts, incredible music, um, and we would just play them. And that's how they would develop. And so it forced me to go a little deeper than just going spangling, spangling, spangling. Like, okay, how can I keep this, even though we're playing the same set basically at the Vanguard or at the jazz showcase or wherever we were, we're playing the same set. How can I keep this song interesting every night? Because you got to go deeper. You got to be more creative. And so those were two very important gigs that I can I think shaped who I am, uh, greatly shaped who I am and how I approach music today. Interesting. It's it's always fun comparing notes with people to see how our experiences with New York and moving to New York overlay. And for sure, I was very, very green when I moved to New York. And that's, in retrospect, I don't know if I'd recommend that because when I was in my 20s, I was like, this was a bad idea. I should have gotten a lot more stuff together before I moved here. Now I'm not so sure. I think maybe there are advantages to coming of age, uh, getting your ass kicked uh, at the needle and so forth. But to go back in time in your story even more, it sounds like you arrived in New York with a lot of stuff together already. And I'm wondering, to the degree you're able to say, what do you think sort of formative experiences and work you put in before that prepared you to arrive in New York? And the first few times you sit in already sound and feel good enough that people wanted to play with you again. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, anybody who's considering moving to New York, uh, either now or back when we moved, uh, you never feel ready. So I definitely didn't feel ready. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, trying to move. In fact, I was considering moving to Chicago first because uh, it was closer and it was a smaller scene and I I was more familiar. And my brother, who's a, a pianist, he's like, no, don't don't move to, he was already in New York. He's like, don't move to Chicago because you're going to get there and you're going to com get comfortable and you're going to end up not moving to New York, which is ultimately what you want to do, which is where all my favorite musicians everybody I was listening to lived so I moved there and I think one thing that that hooked me up and that helped me is one studying with um Billy Hart uh he was you know the, the resident um drum guru who come a couple times a semester at Western Michigan University and that completely you know got my head right get got my mindset right uh, on music on how to think of music um, on a deeper level than just the notes. And he really implanted the importance of understanding where things come from. Why, why are we playing this? Um, what's the lineage? Um, and not just kind of focusing on one, one angle or one approach to doing it. Um, he was wide open, you know, and so that really kind of opened me up a lot. And then the other thing that really helped me before moving to New York is just having a chance to play with so many great musicians, but namely, especially uh, Rodney Whitaker and, and other musicians, Dwight Adams, and um, uh, so many, uh, Randy Napoleon, who also lived in Michigan, Rick Rowe, so many great Michigan. I mean, there's a lot of great uh, players in Michigan, especially the East Side. I was from Grand Rapids, where I was also playing with a lot of great musicians, a group called Mind's Eye with Robbie Smith, who I, is an incredible, incredible trumpet player, uh, Steve Talaga. So I think playing with a lot of them, but especially Rodney Whitaker, who was already playing with Wynton Marcellus and Roy Hargrove, um, and he was on the road all the time with them. And I was checking out their music a lot. Uh, Greg Hutchinson was somebody who I was like, I would have every album he was on. My friend, <laughs> I don't, do you know Neil Smith? The name sounds familiar, but no, I don't know him personally. He is a great drummer, great, great cat who lives in New York. He teaches at Berkeley. Um, but he heard me for the first time at, in when I was in college. And I like to tell this story because it, it kind of, it, it's a testimony of how into Greg I was. He heard me for the first time with my, my quintet at the time and uh he uh, came off this off the, the stage and the first thing he said to me he said man well first thing was man you sound great and then this next thing he's like you know who you sound like right and in inside i'm like please don't say greg hutchinson i was always almost embarrassed if he was gonna say that and in fact he said greg hutchinson i said oh man it was, I guess it's a, it's a compliment, but at the same time, I felt like, damn, I, I'm, he knows I'm faking and I'm, I stole all the stuff that I'm playing, but that's how into Greg I was. So for me to have a chance to play with Rodney was just like, okay, this is a chance for me to actually act like I am Greg. So I kind of moved to New York with, with a, not an attitude at all, but with a confidence um, or actually better better than that an ignorance and a naivety of thinking that i actually could play right and i guess i could play to some extent and the main thing that i had together was this i was just trying to bob jimmy cobb um art taylor philly joe greg hutchinson these were like my idols that's how that's all i wanted to do so i had a very strong beat um which is something that um people appreciated especially back then and which stood out when somebody new came to town and had that together uh so i think that's what kind of worked in my favor with helping me get into the scene fairly you know i will say fairly quickly it doesn't mean I, I didn't struggle um i had a temp job and everything but as far as just playing with cats who wanted to swing who could swing and getting on the road a little bit early on, I think that was what helped me uh, 
I mean, I know that's what really helped me get into the scene fairly quickly. One of the paradoxes of New York is the idea that you wouldn't go there unless you wanted to be at the creative hub. And you, you don't go there for monetary reasons. You go there because of the particular people you can play with and the people with whom you can cross paths and the creative energy that can come out of that. Because if you just wanted to make a living, there are plenty of local scenes that where you actually get paid more, the living expenses are lower, et cetera. But the paradox is exactly that, that New York is such a high priced city and in that way, so, kind of hard knocks. So I feel like most of my early years in New York were punctuated by this trying to balance desperation for money with like still giving enough time to the music. And it, another through line I'm, I'm seeing is like, you went to Winnipeg, you did your time there, you stayed patient. So it's, it seems like underlying a lot of your success was just patience, willing to put in the work, willing to or willingness to let things come to you. You know, you had a temp job. You you kind of just kept your head down, made what you need to make, and were playing around with people, which I think is probably still a pretty good template for, for people who want to move to a creative scene. It's like, get the money handled just to the degree you don't need to worry about it. Keep your living expenses low, and then like funnel all the rest of that creative energy into other things, right? Yeah. I, yeah, when I moved there, I, was room I had three roommates in a two-bedroom. <laughs> I'll say that again. I had three roommates in a two bedroom. So it was four of us dudes living in a small New York. It wasn't grungy. It was actually a nice apartment, uh, but it was expensive. So we had to split it amongst four of us. And so I was sharing a room and I didn't think twice about it. I thought it was like, yeah, I'm in New York. I, you know, it's pretty normal, whatever I got to do to be here. And I did that for a year. And looking back, I'm like, I don't know how I lived in the same room and that wasn't a big room with another dude. I mean, he's like one of my best friends, but still it was, it's weird thinking back, but when you're really wanting to be somewhere and, and when that's more important than the comforts of living, um, you know, the luxuries of, of life that you have in other places and your focus is solely on the music um, and just getting better. You really don't think about that stuff. And I think that's actually different now, whereas a lot of, a lot of people moving, especially students moving to New York, um, there's a certain level of comfort that they want to try to maintain, which will kind of inform for better or, or for, you know, for worse or for better, usually for worse, um, their decisions that may be, uh, kind of more geared towards being comfortable. Um, and sometimes it's better to, fo you gotta focus on your passion, focus on the reason why you're really moving somewhere or the reason why you're doing something, which is in, in our case, music. Um, and when we put other things ahead of that, uh, then it, it could work out, but usually it's not gonna maximize your growth it's not going to maximize your your ability to really connect to the scene and what's happening there because you're it's being it's all being informed all your decisions are being formed from your wanting to be comfortable um so as long as you said whatever you have to do just you know make ends meet but after that let's deal with this music at least for now let's be selfish and hopefully you don't have a family and kids that you got to you know, pay things for them and you can really focus on yourself and get deeper into the music in your career. You mentioned you mentioned emulating Hutch a bunch and Hutch was a huge influence for me. And and I suspect just because he kind of shaped the idiom for a generation, i.e. like he was sort of the conduit for Philly Joe and Max into modern playing and was was the guy who took it and, and, and did interesting things with it in a, in a modern context. So I think, I think a lot of us were influenced by him. But by the time I heard you, you sounded very individual. I'm wondering, wondering if you can put a finger on if there was an insight or a growth leap you made in your own playing and what that was. Like if there was a turning point you, you can identify or some kind of insight you had that, that caused you to, to make a jump in your 
creativity. As you know, going to New York, you're going to hear and encounter cats who are playing circles around you. And that is indeed what I saw on a daily basis and felt. And um, yes, that was like the the when I see, you know, seeing that on a, on a daily basis and hearing it was inspiring, but it was also very intimidating. And it made me very seriously consider moving back to Michigan um, eight months after, you know, like within the first eight months, I was really seriously moving back because I'm thinking, why am I here? I, like everybody is so much better. Um, and so that kind of was always in my head until I moved back. I was on the road and that went back to New York for something and it felt like home finally. So this is my home. Okay. So that happened, but I still, um, I think that one for me, I've never really thought about my individual sound or approach or anything like that. I think it kind of just happened naturally from hearing so many incredible drummers, um, hearing how different their approach is. Um, and so I really try to embrace all the diversity in styles and approaches, even within the straight ahead idiom, because that was mainly where I was coming out of. Um, and almost to a fault, because I, I kind of lost myself. I lost that that um, burning, uh, genuine, authentic Quincy that I felt like I carried and brought to New York. Hmm. Um, not that it was original, but it was, it was genuine. It was me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I lost it. And what happened Nate, is I, my friend played a recording of us. Um, well, actually he played a recording. He's like, man, I want you to check this out. And it was an organ trio and it was swinging. I was like, damn, who is that man? That's great. It's like, that's us in, in college. And it was so timely because I was like just floundering. I just didn't know what I was doing anymore. I was cha I changed my ride symbol approach and I've changed my technique. Um, and so it all really helped me in the long run. But in the sh at this point, I was I was lost and I heard this and I remembered that feeling that I used to have that I had lost. And so that really helped me get back in touch with who I what what I valued in music and how I really wanted to approach the music. Um, so from that point, I've I've tried to learn and gain as much um, skill as many skills and uh, all new perspectives and just try to incorporate it into what I am already doing as opposed to departing from what I was doing. Um, and so I think doing that. Also, having studied with Billy, a lot comes back comes back to Billy in that, um, you know, he told me when before I moved to New York, he said, you know, when you move to New York, you're actually going to gain confidence. And I was like, what? That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't make sense because there's so many great cats there. And it didn't make, make sense until years later after I'd been in New York where it's very true. You know, you're in New York, the greatest city in the world, the greatest place for music, any kind of music you want. Um, and here you are, you know, if you're if you're fortunate to, to last more than a couple of years, you do start to gain confidence. And it also coupled with you working and practicing and shedding. Um, I started to gain confidence in what I did as opposed to what I couldn't do. And that really help me just lean into my strengths rather rather than worry about my weaknesses. And for, and so I, I kind of carry that with me. Um, and I can't necessarily point to a single. Well, actually, I was playing a gig, a gig at Smalls and I was working on this thing. I was really into Ed Blackwell and a thing leading with my my left hand, you know, so like I had been shedding this thing and I was on a gig and it was really pushing me. The music was really pushing me. And this thing started coming out and I started to find musical reason to tap into it. It was a very natural. And there was something in that gig and the subsequent gigs around that time that this approach started opening up my playing in a way that I hadn't really felt before. And what I value in my playing is the fact that there's tradition and I value the tradition. The tradition is so important. 
Um, and I and I've studied all the cats, Max, Philly, um, Buhena, like I've studied all of them and I can kind of mimic their style and and but what I also value is the fact that I'm very open. And this is again thanks to Billy, because he would say, I'm the natural extension of Philly Joe Jones. That's what Billy Hart would say. And I was like, really? I don't hear. And then I would check him out and hear, I'm like, oh. He is. I, I can hear all that. And you hear the Max, you hear the Tony, you hear. And that really helped me to understand how you don't have to be stuck in the past. You can study it, but it's important not to be stuck there. And it's important to use it to get to what it, whatever is happening now in your life and musically, whatever you're trying to do. And so that, that kind of really helped me understand that it's okay if, if you don't play that Max Roach thing, or if, if someone doesn't necessarily hear that influence, as long as you're being true to who you are and trust that you've studied enough of the tradition, that that foundation is there, that even when you're not playing in that style, everyone can still feel the essence of the the, lex the jazz drum set lexicon um, that is, to me, is very important. You touched on so many universals, though, I, and it's stuff that when I speak to other great players keeps coming up and it's stuff that resonates with my experience too. And I think it's because there's this hyper object that's called improvisation. That's different from a lot of other things. It, it may be similar to things like surfing or martial arts or other sort of like flow related activities where there's like a, a mind body connection. I think it's probably similar to, to speaking and, and conversing actually, but I think the thing I think the thing that makes it magical and difficult and ineffable is that there are two halves to it. So one half is that you if you're a mature player as as Billy Hart was alluding to as uh, a drummer named Jamie Haddad uh, told me when I took a lesson with him like way back in the early 2000s the the only way forward is to be authentically yourself and to trust that the muse is going to come through you. So if 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 I was and I'm, I'm fessing up here, if, if I was trying to look cool or trying to get my licks out, that was that was a less mature form of playing than trusting my ears and trusting my instincts. But to do that is very very scary and. And it also takes a long time before stuff that you like comes out organically. So, so you try to tap into that dream state. You try to reach that place. There's always a risk, especially as you're developing, that what comes out of you isn't, isn't going to be cool or isn't going to sound good. And it, it can take a long time to, for, for all of that stuff to gel. And I'm curious now that you've been teaching is this is this something that you recognize a ton in terms of like what your students say to you and the questions your students ask and if so like what lessons can you take from your own experience to help their journey through that hinterland go better for them if you, could you just like distill that into a, a short like i want to make sure i'm understanding your question correct so with my own students we end up speaking a lot about this is really hard. I hate everything I play. I'm trying to I'm trying to trust you and and play uh, play by instinct and and not try to sound cool and not consciously try to show off in the moment and just let the vocabulary come through me. But I don't like anything I'm doing. I see these other players; they're all better than me. So so I think I think it's that journey, that difficult crucible getting from like an aspiring player just to just to sort of the first plateau of playing in flow and actually liking what liking how you sound and so i guess my question is two parts like number one do your do you have students who who struggle with that is that like something you that comes up with with you and your students and and if so like is there anything you can draw on from your own experience that you feel like is helpful in guiding them so one kind of mantra I, I kind of I'm always kind of speaking with my students is and, you know, not everyone's going to agree with this, but um, 
what's really helped me, honestly, because I, I get anxiety playing, man. I, 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 and I'm being super, super candid right now. I don't I haven't told many people this, but I don't love performing. You know, I don't love I don't look forward to playing gigs. And it's not because I don't love music and it's not because I don't love playing, but I don't love the the anxiety that I get with it. Um, and that that mental game that we, we all kind of go through. And so um, and so but I say that because I've had what's helped me um, handle playing and performing is this mantra of the idea that I, I want to keep my standards high, but keep my expectations low. And and so that's what that's how I go into every gig. Right. My standards are my standards and I have very high standards. I have a very, uh, you know, I have record, you know, uh, literally and figuratively of my high standards. So I don't have to worry about that. Yes, I have those high standards. But today is today. And those whatever happened in the past does not matter. And it does not apply to what's happening right now, what I'm playing right now. So if I'm expecting what happened yesterday to happen today, that's that's a losing battle. So I have literally and I tell myself I have literally very extremely low standards for myself when I go to play. Of course, I'm trying to and I'm I'm shooting for in a perfect world, I'm able to achieve much higher than what I'm expecting. But if I keep those those expectations low, then it kind of takes the pressure off of me trying to sound good and play good and play that thing really good. And because it's when we're in that mindset, we're not going to actually we're going to do the opposite. And it's also not going to be musical. And we're not actually present because we're bringing an agenda. And that's that's never good. So that's something I tell my students because inevitably, um, there, yeah, you want to sound good as we should, but sometimes when that um, that thought is the stronger thought, rather than I want to make music, I want to be present, I want to play with, I want to make music with the musicians I'm playing with at the time, then. You know, it could be it could be an it could have a negative effect effect. So that's the first thing I, I tell my students. Um, don't worry about it. And I and I also say exactly what happened to me is just really focusing on the tradition and or whatever you're studying, whatever you're working on, really putting energy into that. And if you're really putting enough energy into it, you're practicing it and you're focused and you're really being uh, intentional with what you're getting out of your practicing, if you want to get that thing or these things or whatever, and you're putting a certain level of energy into that, when you get to the gig, obviously you forget it. You just got to play. But if you're really putting in that work, then it's going to come out in some way, shape or form, whether you know it or not, sometimes um, very obviously and other times less obviously. But the work that you've just put into the, all that stuff is allowing you to get to whatever you're getting to today. So um, I, I try to make sure that they don't get distracted by the sexy and make sure that they understand that that work that you're that I'm encouraging you and I'm making you um, put in to the drums and to the music is going to come out and it's going to manifest in ways that you have actually no idea at this point, at this moment. So you have to kind of trust the process as, a, as they always say in sports, trust the process. Um, and it is, like you said, very similar to how we learn language. It's the same exact process. And if that is the case, then you can't force it. You can't force it. You just got to do the thing, study, listen, practice, play, all that, that whole kind of cycle. And over time, it starts to come together to the point where you're saying, oh, okay, I can kind of hear it. Yeah, I can hear how this is starting to, to come together. But at in, in the early stages, it's all discombobulated. <laughs> and we, you know, and everything is kind of like, everything we try to play, it's like an open sore. It's all still, you know, <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're like sores, like we're we're like picking. Okay, we're picking at that thing. Now we're picking at, and it's just all open, and it's and it's not very 
it's not a part of us yet. Like it hasn't healed. It hasn't become just a part of our body. And once that happens, though, when it comes, be, when it becomes a part of our body and a, a part of who we are, then that's when we start to actually sound mature because we don't have to try to get these things to come out. It's just who we are now. Speaking of the work that we put in behind the drums, to use the language analogy, let's say people say one of the most difficult things about learning English is all of the exceptions. Like it's not a very rule-based language. The rules will only get you so far. Um, for me with, with Spanish, one of the hardest things is like the shapes I have to make with my tongue to avoid having like a thick American accent. What do you think based on your experience teaching is the hardest thing to learn in terms of sounding like a native speaker at jazz drums? That's, that's such a good question. How you're fluent in Spanish. I'm learning. Where are you? Like, one to ten. I'm just curious. Oh, um, well, I can have basic conversations. I I took it in high school. I'm 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 trying to like get back to that level very very gradually. I feel like it's coming back, and then the pronunciation's really tough. Uh, but I just I'll literally put in. I try to put in a half hour a day at least, just reading things out loud and making sentences, just to like practice that that muscle memory. So baby steps. Baby steps. Yeah. Um, damn, that's a great question. Getting to a level of, uh, sounding native, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. I never really thought about it like that. I mean, I've thought about the analogy, of course, uh, with, with language. I speak actually Japanese. I learned Japanese just through the years of going there. I studied it when I was in New York and got really serious. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty fluent in Japanese and I always try to think about the processes, hmm. how they're similar. And so, um, one thing that, that for me, like when I speak Japanese, I'm not fast and I don't speak fast anyway, but especially when I'm speaking of a different language, um, when I speak, so I had this, this situation, I was in Japan and I was speaking with my friend, um, and then there was a, a foreigner next to me who actually lived there. I never lived there. I've lived, stayed there a couple months. That was the maximum, but they actually lived there many years and it was clear. And they were just, I'm like, dang, how did they? And I was thinking, man, it would be great to get to that level. But then I was listening closer and it didn't sound that good. Uh, and and uh, and I, I, I asked my friend, I was like, does that sound good? Like, what's that sound? Yeah, it sounds a little funny, but I mean, you can understand it. They, they're fluent. And I realize, and I've had, I've been complimented on my enunciation and the clarity of with which I speak the language. Not saying I'm like, you know, I'm amazing, but um, I value the, the quality of the sound and the way it sounds. And I, I value, um, you know, the native sounding approach to speaking the language which probably has also slowed me in in how I pro progress in my fluency. But, um, and I think that for me in music, I care about that as well. And I, I, in music, um, when I listen to Art Taylor, when I listen to all the greats, Joe Jones, Philly Joe, uh, Mel Lewis, there's a certain quality I was talking to Ali Jackson. He said he's, he mentioned the word or the phrase quality of time of time, mm. your, the quality of your time, the quality with which you hit the drums, the quality with which you're um, the clarity with which you're able to, the, to convey the idea, to express the idea. I care about that. And I think that the more someone cares about what really the, the quality that the masters played with, the quality, not the, just the stuff, not just the phrases, not just the notes, but the quality of their notes and the depth and the, the feeling behind it and the reasons why they're playing that. I think focusing on those things will help somebody sound 
much more native than somebody who has a lot of stuff and and has heard it and can kind of mimic it. And it sounds cool and they're completely fluent in what they're doing, but it's missing the, the thing that really, really attracts us all to all of the greats who do it, which is the quality and the, the um, clarity and the meaning, the intent, all those things. For me, even if they're not necessarily as far uh, developed in their musical journey or whatever, to me, that's I value that. And I think of that more as speaking the language more native than somebody who's much further along on the instrument and also further along in studying the music. That resonates immediately. And yeah, that really, really tracks with my own story when... Earlier, I was asking you about your central sort of insight in your own development. And I think maybe my biggest insight, there have been a few, but my, maybe my biggest insight was sort of mid 20 aughts when I just realized that was a thing. I realized like, oh, touch, relative volume, subdivision, like what, what the prog rockers call zones, playing clean, not flaming, the consistency of the subdivision of the eighth notes, all this stuff. Were, were a thing. And I'm like, oh, this goes way deeper than I thought. How do you, how do you put a student in touch with that? How, how do you help them become aware of, of that sort of hidden world of details? Yeah, I, I got to be very annoying <laughs> with it <laughs> and constantly not letting one note slip by without making sure they know exactly what they just did. Um, I, I, you know, um, I think that's one thing, obviously demonstrating it. I've learned, uh, again, I, I don't, I'm not like a flashy player. I'm not going to be somebody that you, you see it like, oh my gosh, that's, um, but when somebody studies with me, I've learned the power of just doing it as opposed to just trying to explain it. So my lessons will consist of me talking and having the students mostly play. But when I get to that point where I just need to just play it um, for them to see it, sometimes when I do that, that can be way powerful. And they realize, wow, he really did intend to play the, the get that sound out of the drum or whatever, have this much of the, the stick into the drum and this much on the, the rim or whatever. Like every decision, I want them to really realize that you have to, intend every note that you're playing and, and how you're playing it. So I try to demonstrate more. Uh, I used to not demonstrate as much, but I realized the power of that. Um, and then obviously I'm like constantly referring to albums. If I say something, I need somebody to back me up. <laughs> and uh, who better than to just put on a record of Kenny Washington, of, you know, Mel Lewis, of, check out this part of this song. Do you see how they, these eight measures of Elvin, he went from this to this to the, oh, now I, and it's amazing the power of just putting on an album and them hearing somebody actually do exactly what you were just saying. Um, so though between, I think those approaches to, to showing them, they start to value it in, they start to value it. They see why I value it. And they start to value those things themselves. And I start to trick them into playing in a way that sounds a lot more native than what they thought sounded really good and sounded native. And, um, you know, it's like a surface level approach compared to more of a mature, seasoned, real, um, well-rounded approach. Yeah, that, that completely resonates. I want to transition one last time to talk about your YouTube channel because you started putting out YouTube videos a few years ago and I don't know whether it was just my little bubble but I was like oh like some somebody's finally bringing like the authentic jazz stuff I'm I'm curious what was the inspiration to start the YouTube channel and how does that fit in with everything else you're doing like what's what's what purpose does it serve for you well, let's see. I think I started my YouTube channel around 2014, somewhere in there. When did you start yours? Around the same time, 2013, 2014. 
So why do you have so many more subscribers, man? What's up, man? What's up? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think because I'm willing to do dumb clickbait stuff and court controversy. And, and I'm also extremely consistent because I don't have a day job. I would say those two things. <laughs> right, right. No, but I, I would say I, I've been thinking about this. And I, naturally, as a, as a YouTuber, um, you want your numbers to be high all the time. And, uh, and then I realized, man, I'm teaching jazz drum set. <laughs> There's not, I mean, compared to just the average drummer, the percentage of drummers who are actually interested in what I'm doing um, are just a lot smaller. And so I've kind of accepted that and in, in, um, realizing that, that that's okay. And at the same time, I'm having an effect on a lot of drummers as you are. And I commend everything you're doing, whatever, however you got to get there. The information that you're putting out is great. I've watched your videos and um, you're very detailed in the uh, the reason why you're you're creating the video. So maybe to get the, the views, there's a certain strategy, but the content is great. So so congrats to you. I appreciate that. Keep on doing it. Um, for me, the impetus to start my channel was. Honestly, I was not thinking about numbers. I wasn't thinking about anything that I'm thinking about now compared comparatively. I was honestly just thinking about, man, these are some concepts that I'm always talking about with students, these ja jazz concepts. Um, and it would be cool to just have a place where they could just go to and, and see me talking about and breaking down some of these concepts that seem to be, you know, hard to understand because... It's just the nature of jazz. Um, it's just like a very, it's a, it can be ambiguous, some of these concepts. So that was the first impetus. And the other thing is having left New York, I wanted to stay relevant and I wanted to kind of keep my name somewhat in the ether. And so I'm like, okay, if I do a YouTube channel, that will be my way of reaching out and um, getting out connecting with drummers outside of this super small insular uh small sit well actually it wasn't it's not that small it's a million people but winnipeg is it feels like i'm in the middle of siberia honestly especially in the winters it was ridiculous um but so i felt very isolated and i just wanted to stay connected and the the third reason was i wanted to get my name out as a as a pedagogue um because that was what I was doing. And it was also going to help, hopefully, help me recruit some some drummers from around the Canada, but also from within the States. So those were the main, the main reasons, actually. Um, and I, and I didn't realize the effect it was having until I would travel and drummers would start to, and I know you've experienced this, recognize me at a store or whatever, they say, wait, are you, you're, you're that guy who's putting out this jazz, man, keep on doing, they've been so helpful. And having heard that, you know, so many times early on, I realized, wow, okay, I'm reaching a lot of drummers around the world. And for that reason, I should, I should probably continue to do this. If I, if I want to help drummers understand this music and, uh, break down the barriers of of jazz. It doesn't have to be so mystifying, you know, and I think it's easy to kind of have that impression of the music. But um, from what I've heard, the way I break it down makes it accessible. And that was, that kind of motivated me to continue and to actually lean into it and to be a little more consistent with it. Um, so that's, those are the reasons. Yeah. And I think you're exactly right that, it's not only about broad, it's about deep. So particularly because jazz is kind of a small niche, but it's also one that attracts very, very passionate people. And it has, as part of it, this, this need to go sort of multiple frames deep until you perceive all of those, those hidden threads that, that create the detail that makes the great players great. So I think touching a few drummers and it's inspiring them deeply and and providing a space where you can kind of be the go-to for authentic jazz. And I also think like you've been doing it long enough that you're like analog native, but also YouTube native. 
And I think that's always going to be better than somebody who comes from the gig world or like their, their, their company makes a channel for them and they, they just like put up a couple videos. Like they're, they're just not going to know how to convey the material. So I think, I think that makes your, your stuff really unique too. Well, listen, this has been great. I'm, I'm so happy we finally found a time to, to chat. Uh, I, I think we got into really, really great territory and I think people really, really appreciate your insights. We'll link your YouTube and your Instagram when this episode goes live. Is there anything else you'd like people to check out uh, that you've got going on? I have a digital download store with a bunch of playlongs and um, some PDFs that a lot of drummers have found helpful. Um, so they can check that out. It's just um, maybe I'll, I'll give you the link. Yeah, we'll put that in the description. Yeah, and then any drummers, of course, who are interested in studying with me, I teach at the University of North Texas. So um, check me out here. Check us out. We're doing a lot of great things here. It's a lot of fun. Other than that, I'll just I'll be doing continue to do what I'm doing and uh, hopefully get to hang out sometime in person. Nate, you know, sounds great, man. Well, it's been great hanging out. I uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, I'll ping you before the episode goes up. But otherwise, uh, talk to you soon. All right, man. Take care. Take Peace. care. Bye bye.